Welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself on The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay, and we're continuing our discussions with Stephen Cohen about Russia, the United States, and Trump, and Putin. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you. For Stephen's bio, just look under the video player, but watch the earlier segments. Uh, but I'll plug your book. People should read this book. It's important. Uh, it's called War with Russia, question mark, from Putin and Ukraine to Trump and Russiagate. And let me say, well, in the last segment, I'm arguing with you about the, how to characterize Trump. And I don't know, maybe we'll argue again. Um, I think your contribution on this issue is extremely important. I know you've been in, under incredible pressure and ice, getting isolated on this uh, point. And uh, I think it's brave of you to take the stance you do. Okay, let's just move on. In the early years of Putin's presidency, uh, the West quite liked him. They, I guess they thought he would be a continuation of Yeltsin. I think they had expectations that he would help facilitate an American, uh, I don't know if the, the world ta takeover is too strong, but allowing American mining companies and energy companies and finance to come in. And instead, what emerged with a state with real laws and an oligarchy emerged, which I think uh, at some point the Russian people will have to deal with because I don't think it's good for them, but it's up to them. Uh, that being said, America didn't get a free for all. Um, but as as this relationship with the West became uh, more and more tense, and I think f to a large extent for these reasons, the Americans didn't get everything they wanted out of Russia. Uh, the uh, I don't understand why Putin didn't uh, take more of the Chinese stance, which is avoid direct confrontation as much as you can and build up your strength. And I don't get Crimea. Uh, Crimea was it, it's and you suggest in your book, wasn't there an alternative? To the annexation, uh, it, it, there wasn't like an immediate threat. I know there was a right wing takeover, a far right takeover of Ukraine. The Americans certainly uh, facilitated and helped engineer it. It is a kind of strategic threat. I mean, all I think that's clear and you've made the case very eloquently. But still, why poke uh, Europe and the United States in the eye and kind of make the case of the anti-detente forces? Oh, look, you know, Russia's on the move. It starts with Crimea and Georgia will be next, and then it will be the whole of Ukraine. Of course, it didn't start with Crimea, and that's just the argument that people who don't wish to understand the Russian point of view make. It didn't start with Crimea. It began with the expansion of NATO to Russia's borders. No doubt. Well, not only no doubt, but for Putin and for the Russian political class, that was the context in the prism through which they viewed Western and particularly American policy toward Russia. So when the Ukrainian crisis began in 2013, let's remember what happened because it does lead to the annexation of Crimea. In 2013, the European Union told the then president of uh, Ukraine, uh, Yanukovych, and he may have been a rotter, but he was constitutionally and legally elected. It would have been a clean election. He was the president. That um, he needed to sign a economic partnership with the European Union. Uh, it meant, in effect, losing his preferred trade status with Russia, which constituted about 40 percent of Ukrainian trade not to mention about three to four million Ukrainians who worked in Russia to support their families, were allowed to do so, and allowed to send their salaries back to Ukraine to support their families. So Ukraine was heavily dependent on Russia economically, and along comes the European Union that wants to exclude Russia from this new arrangement. So Putin says, Putin and his foreign minister Lavrov say, look guys, uh, why not a tripartite arrangement? It'd be good for everybody. We'll have an economic preferred agreement with Russia, Ukraine, and the European Union. And Washington and Brussels said no. Russia can't participate. Yanukovych, for that reason, declined to sign the agreement, and that led to the Maidan uprising and Yanukovych flees from office to Russia. So, 
Putin now is sitting in Moscow and Crimea comes to the fore because you've got a very right wing and I would say crazy government in power saying outlandish things, including, you know, Crimea is ours and we're going to expel the Russian naval base there, which was there by treaty. They had at least, I think, 25 years on the base. There were 22,000, by law, Russian soldiers on the Crimean base. They were already there. All right. So Putin's sitting here. He sees some kind of threat. Maybe it's rhetorical. But bad things are ha happening. This was a very violent uprising. You remember the burning buildings in, in, in Kiev and Maidan. If you watch this on TV, this was violence. It was very serious. Snipers killed, I think, 85 to 100 people on Maidan just before Yanukovych fled. They said that the snipers were sent by Yanukovych, but we now know they weren't. They were sent by neo-fascists, Ukrainian neo-fascists on Maidan. But remember, Putin's operating in a context that's moving very fast, very dangerous. Intelligence is sparse, not clear. But there's clearly a new government in Kiev that's laying claim not only to uh, Crimea forever, but to expelling the Russian naval base there. So Putin has to decide. The back history is Putin never showed any interest in Crimea until that moment. However, it had been an issue in Russian politics when Putin ran for president in 2000. There was a party headed by two very influential men, the, very, the former mayor of Moscow, Lushkov, and the former foreign minister, Primakov, who had advocated uh, uh, reuniting Crimea with Russia because Crimea had traditionally been a Russian province. I think somewhere like, don't speak of ethnicity, speak of language, Something like 85% of the population speaks Russian as a native language. I mean, enormous number. It's, it's, it's a Russian province. And it was only an act of accident under Khrushchev that had been assigned administratively when the Soviet Union existed to Ukraine because Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union. So what was Putin supposed to do? So to the extent that we know how he made the decision, he was told by his intelligence people, all leaders in crisis depend on intelligence take Crimea today through a referendum and peacefully. And by the way, they were polling like crazy. They knew they'd get 85 plus. They knew this. If they had, and the referendum was completely open. All this crap about at gunpoint is nonsense. I mean, it was a fair referendum and Gallup has been going back to Crimea and polling. They get the same number. 85% want to be with Russia. Putin is told do it by the ballot the box today or fight a war there tomorrow. That's what he was told. What would you have done in his place? See, it's easy for you, Paul, and me, Steve, to sit here and debate what leaders, Trump, any leader, Kennedy, Putin, should do in a crisis situation without knowing the circumstances or what we would do in that situation. I mean, but they have to act and they have to act fast. Okay, and they're but dependent in your book, on the you suggest there might have been an alternative. Well, I, I can just simply tell you what Putin was told as the alternative. Uh, one group said you have to take Crimea now. The polls show Crimeans will vote to join Russia. There is an international law that rever referendums are binding and legal. We'll have a referendum, we'll get the result, and they'll vote to join Russia and we'll take them in. Do that. The other view was Hold the referendum, but don't welcome them into, into Russia. Use it as a bargaining card with the West and Kiev when we see how the Maidan so-called revolution, it wasn't a revolution, but the Maidan coup, it was a coup against Yanukovych. Let's see what comes next. But that'll be a diplomatic card we could play. Go ahead and have the referendum. They will vote to join Russia, but that doesn't mean because they've requested to join Russia, we have to say okay. Just take that and say to the West, look, the Crimean people want to join Russia. We understand that that may be, you know, difficult for you. Can we find a way to solve this problem short of annexation? In other words, can we get guarantees for Crimea? So Putin was told that was an option and he didn't choose it. 
And I try to put myself in his shoes and say, what would I have done? And the problem is, is I don't know the intelligence. For example, there is a report, I don't believe or disbelieve it, that NATO commandos were found on Crimea, on the peninsula. I don't know if that's true. Maybe it was scuttlebutt. Did Putin know it to be true? I don't know. But we have yet to be told the whole story of what happened between the coup in Kiev, because it was a coup, it overthrew the president, and the decision, Russians don't say annex, they say rejoin with, uh, welcome Crimea home, to make that decision. One day we'll know more, and then we'll be able to decide if Putin really had a choice. Do you, and I don't want to have any, I don't have any detailed knowledge about the situation. I don't have enough. N never mind. You understand there's a question mark by what I say. We don't know for sure. Yeah. But was, do you think there might have been an option to have a referendum that took a little, there was more time, maybe yeah, get sure. the United Nations involved, a right, little, so that, something that gives a little more recognition to it. Without naming names. And I'm not talking the morality here, no, I'm talking no, no, tactical. I'm not, practical yeah. politics. Yeah. Yeah. The point is, is that Putin was told, now mind you, this is an, I mean, it's a good thing that he's a former KGB officer, by the way. Henry Kissinger, when he first met Putin, and he learned, this was when Putin was working as deputy mayor in, in, in St. Petersburg, and Kissinger met him. And uh, Putin said to Kissinger, you know, I began in intelligence, and Kissinger said that's the best way to start a political career. And Kissinger had started in intelligence during the war, right? Because these guys think, and maybe they're right, that if you're trained in intelligence, you're able to evaluate intelligence. That is, you aren't going to be fooled by your own intelligence people, that you can sort out false intelligence from legitimate intelligence. Putin was in a position, I think, to evaluate the intelligence. So the question here that you raise is true. Why didn't they wait? And he was told we can't wait. Do you think it's part Events of, are moving too fast. In the earlier, last segment, you talked about the pressure on him that he's not proactive enough. Yes. Is this that, partly responding to that kind of pressure? Yes, and, is, and, I, and that's why I want to return to this issue that only once before had Crimea been an issue in Russian politics, when a political party ran against Putin on a platform that we should somehow get Crimea back. They got, I think, 2% of the vote. There was no, no, no popular support for this. Putin was disdainful of the idea. In other words, this was something. This was not aggression. This is ridiculous. This was a decision imposed upon him by circumstances that he did not create, but to which he now had to react. And I don't know whether he knew it or not, but that was probably his most historic decision. And I mean, it's not his most historic, but it is part of what will forever define his role for Russians in Russian history, forever. So let's get to the big underlying you question. You can go to here. Moscow and buy a poster in a shop. And at the top is a map of Crimea, a very distinctive peninsula, right? On one side is Khrushchev, who signed Crimea over to Ukraine, right, when, in 1954-55 when the Soviet Union existed. On the other side is a picture of Putin, and it simply says, he gave away, he took back. <laughs>